Hello everyone, we're just gonna reinvite Masao here. Hello, Space Frog. So for those who uh, don't know, we're also streaming on Twitch, so I might say names that you're not familiar with. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to our How to Break Into the Industry series. Uh, for this time, is about quality assurance. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm the community manager, <laughs> community development manager for our work with Indies. Um, and uh, this is a series that we do monthly about um, many, many um, disciplines in the game industry. And without further ado, I will let Masao introduce himself and our guests. Uh, hello, Masao. Hello, um, my name is Masao. I'm an indie producer in Montreal and the host for the How to Break Into Games uh, roundtable here at uh, Work With Indies. Thank you all for coming um, and uh, thank you to all of our uh, roundtable panelists, I guess. Is that what we're calling them? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, this uh, this session is uh, about QA roles. So that's what we're going to focus on talking about. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's get this rolling. Um, uh, Jessica, please introduce yourself. Sure thing. Uh, first off, thank you all for having me. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Jessica Gonzalez. I am a senior technical test analyst for Lightforge Games. And yeah, really excited to be part of this roundtable. Um, I'll move it to Hannah. Hey everybody, uh, same as Jessica, I'm super happy to be here and share my experience uh, with everybody. Uh, my name is Anne. I'm a publisher at an indie, uh, not a publisher, sorry, a producer at an indie publisher. And uh, yeah, that's it. Sending it to Jade Cat. Awesome. Hello, my name's Jade. Uh, I'm currently working as a junior designer in Montreal uh, at an indie studio. I have about three years of QA experience other than that, but uh, yeah, that's me. Okay, so um, the first thing, uh, like uh, the first question um, I want to ask people is, uh, how did you get your first uh, role in QA? So um, I guess this time we'll go the other direction. So uh, Jay. Awesome, yeah, totally. Uh, so my first uh, job in the industry and uh, in QA was uh, an external role. So I, I applied essentially to a, company's, a company called Keywords. Um, it was a super basic entry position, but essentially the process was that they like passed uh, an entrance exam, which I went through, did okay on. And uh, yeah, I, I got hired and started as a, a certification QA for uh, platforms. I guess since we're going in the opposite direction, I will pass it off. To uh, you. Yeah, Anna. <laughs> Sorry, I was waiting for the transition. Um, I um, I sent my resume to Activision's QA because they had a QA department in Quebec City uh, called um, affectionately QAQ. Um, I knew someone who worked there, but I decided to try my best to, to do it on my own since um, I was in my 30s when I, I sent my resume there. So I had been gaming all my life and I figured that that was enough. Um, they didn't even call me back the first time, so I had to go through my friend and then they called me back. Uh, I, I had an interview with them. I don't believe we had tests, like a, a short questionnaire. And I started as a regular QA tester in their QA department. So passing it on to Jessica. Yeah, similarly to Hannah, um, I started at Activision QA. Uh, funny enough, I actually went to school for pharmacy technician, and then I had a friend who uh, was working at Activision in El Segundo, California. I live in California, um, where they were looking for QA testers for Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Um, I remember sending in my resume, um, just wildly passionate about video games, played a lot of FPSs, um, and yeah, I did an interview with them. Um, they 
uh, had called me back and um, I was kind of put in like a three day training where we learned a lot of like technical terms for testing and different types of bug bugs that we would be running into. Um, and then kind of had like a quiz at the end of that uh, and passed that. Um, and then I became a contracted QA tester. So worked with a company called Volt. A lot of um, entry uh, QA rules are actually contract based. And yeah, I got to work on Black Ops 3, which is a really fun project. And that's how I started. Um, so uh, I don't, uh, this wasn't in the list of questions I initially uh, sent to you, but uh, let's talk about um, how, uh, how your career kind of developed uh, from that point on. Um, can you talk uh, shortly about kind of where you are now and uh, the process of uh, of getting there? Uh, let's start with uh, Anna. Okay, um, my my uh, I've traveled a little bit, just to be honest. Um, I went to QA because first of all, I I had a bachelor's in translation, and I wanted to do localization for games. And when I talked to prospective um, translation like uh, offices and everything like that they basically let me know that if there was ever going to be some QA translation not some translation for games uh newbies were not going to do it so I figured going in QA uh, was a good way to do that at some point we had an opportunity to meet with uh some Activision's uh higher ups and we met with uh, Chris Ahrens at this time who was I think the QA manager so we chatted with them and uh, I basically asked them like uh, localization, what is the situation with them? Because no studio seems to have um, translators in the house. So they basically told me that it was in Dublin and I would have to move. So I said, oh, okay, maybe I'm gonna change my plan. Um, and when I started as a QA, uh, I discovered there were so many things to the, the job that I didn't know. Uh, people think often that is only gaming, but there's so much more to it. And having gamed most of my life, I got in there and saw so many uh, nerds, quote unquote, being so much better at it because there's so much complexity to it. I guess I kind of fell in love with how uh, the sausage is made. So I continued into multiple roles uh, at Activision. I did regular QA, worked on Cog Ghost, uh, did the grueling 72 hours a week. Um, notice I didn't like crunch, like most people. Uh, I did also some tester corrector stuff at Activision. I left for another indie studio in Quebec called Freema. I did three months there. Uh, I worked um, on different projects, mostly like indie games, web stuff. I did a little bit of translation while I was there as well. Went back to Activision because I wanted to focus on PC and console things and Freema did mostly like mobile and also web stuff, uh, which is very different as far as testing, like mobile is kind of, is complex as well as difficult. So I went back to Activision and I was a floor lead on uh, Guitar Hero Live. Uh, learned a lot as well because they were doing some, some live um, programming and everything on the backhand. So we would have like builds that were great one day and then the next day we had to have crashes. So learned a lot there. Um, I then went on to Larian Studios. I did four years there. I did multiple things, including regular QA, localization, a little bit of art QA as well. Um, I did a couple events for them, like PAX. And uh, I was trying to find like uh, my path because I did not know where what I wanted to do. Um, so talk to people in the house um, was um, pointed towards production. Uh, I thought production was boring at first, but I learned through Larian um, and doing um, the organization, I guess, and supervision of the localization for Baldur's Gate 3's early access that I actually really liked production. And a lot of the stuff that you learn uh, in QA is also, is also really, really useful. Um, a lot of the people that I work with actually right now have a background in production, uh, not production, but sorry, but QA. Um, it helps you like understand a lot of stuff. So after I did a little stint in production at Larian, I got recruited at Become an Indie Studio and did some production there. Um, I'm gonna try to keep it short, I'm sorry. Uh, went from an AP to a producer in like three months because the producer on my main game left. So 
So I was asked to um, take over from him, which I did. And it was very stressful, but uh, a lot of the stuff, like I said, that we learned in QA, the pressure, the crunch, and everything like that uh, was useful to me. And uh, after I did like a year and a half, I think at Beacom, I went to Good Shepherd Entertainment, where I am right now, and I am a producer uh, for indie games. So that's the long, short story. Okay, um, how about uh, Jade? Awesome, yeah. So it's gonna be a bit tough to follow all that up. Uh, for context, I'm kind of a new face to the industry. Uh, essentially, I started out uh, fresh out of high school, a bunch of hopes in my pocket, applied to this uh, like a third party uh, QA company called Keywords. Um, I was there for three years and uh, the very first project I got onto um, was kind of like this evergreen. It's where I spent most of my time about two years um, and I was doing um, like console certification work. Um, and so I got to see like a bunch of different games, see like all the different types of issues that can happen uh, when you're developing a game. And it really enriched kind of the experience for me. Uh, eventually, though, the kind of project did fall through and I got moved into kind of like a FQA role. So that's functionally quality assurance. Um, and I found that like the grind of working on a single day on a single game for like days at a time um, eventually started to wear down a little bit on me. Um, like throughout this whole time, um, like uh, the way that the company was structured, essentially, it was uh, separated into tiers. And I wasn't really interested in moving up that um, that rank system, um, just like because what was waiting for me was kind of like a, a more lead role, and I was interested on in being more on the ground floor, just keeping my head down working. Um, so eventually, uh, I started to look around, and I applied to a program at um, my college uh, that essentially was all about uh, independent video game design. So I spent a little bit of time there, got to know some amazing people and make a lot of connections, which eventually helped me um, find kind of like a job offer uh, for a role. Um, I kind of weighed my options uh, he heavily and carefully, and eventually um, I decided to go with it. And I'm now a designer at a local indie studio. That's pretty much my story. I can go into more detail on some elements uh, if required, but yeah. Okay, Jessica. Yeah, so um, I started as contract QA in El Segundo on B Call of Duty Black Ops 3, like I mentioned. Um, it was a really long project. I remember working like 14 hour shifts. Uh, I was actually night shift, so we had people working around the clock on that project. Um, I worked for until we shipped, um, and then, you know, at the end of the quarter, they do layoffs. So uh, my entire group was laid off and then uh, about a week later, it was like right before Christmas, I got a call from Treyarch who, um, you know, they usually um, like on the development side, they take a look at a lot of the publishing side bugs. So, and kind of like pick people to work on the developer side. So I got a call. I was able to work on uh, Black Ops 3 continually, um, but uh, my focus was on the zombies team. So we were doing like really high level runs and um, making sure like the Easter eggs were good, um, which was really fun and a really great experience. I, I do like, wor um, I liked that work. <laughs> it was quite different than, you know, I was working on campaigns uh, on Call of Duty prior to that. So I got to try something different, which I really ended up enjoying. Um, and worked there for a few months. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time I got a raise, it was like a 13 cent raise. So I was very like kind of disempowered, uh, felt really bad. So I started looking around for maybe a better paying QA job. And um, I happened upon a job uh, at Blizzard Entertainment for Heroes of the Storm. Uh, still a contract position, just with a different company. Um, which was, a, that was a great project because it was, you know, fairly fresh, uh, really exciting project. I actually worked on the engine and game systems team, which was a very focused, uh, section of quality assurance. Um, there's a lot of like functional QA and then you can branch into like user experience or, um, UI, um, you can do like balance and play testing. Uh, but my 
experience was with engine and game systems. So I was reading a lot of call stacks and reporting crashes and debugging, um, which was really exciting for me because it was the first time that I got to actually be embedded with an engineering team. Um, from Activision, it was very much siloed, like you're closed off from the rest of uh, the development team. So unless you are, you know, d directly working with the team, it's kind of difficult because a lot of tribal knowledge and information sharing isn't as great. So I was able to learn a lot about the system and the engine, um, which I really loved. And um, unfortunately, we were also, our team was affected by layoffs uh, after about six months. And so at the time I felt a little tired with just the way that the AAA games industry kind of like, I call it a meat grinder. It kind of like chews you up. Um, it, it like takes your passions and as you know kind of like how hard can you work to get to the top and it was a little bit tiring especially for people that are marginalized it, i feel like the effort there is a little um you know more taxing uh so i looked at uh indie space and i found this really great company in east la uh they were called aftershock at the time i was working on a project from pre-alpha it was called uh, marvel strike force it's a mobile game really fun um and i remember we were like 30 people a really small team um, and then after soft launch, uh, we actually learned that the company Fox bought our company. So we ended up like tripling our studio size and moving to Playa Vista, California, which is a little more of an expensive area. Um, but that was fun. I got to work on the new user, uh, sorry, new user experience there um, and first time user experiences. So a lot of the tutorials, I actually ended up designing one of the tutorials for a feature, which was really fun just because I had touched the project for so long that um, by the time it was ready to design a new feature for the tutorial, I was the one that knew the most about, you know, how to make the tutorials. Um, so that was really exciting. It's great to be like a knowledge expert in your um, area of QA, and, and I feel like it um, translates well into other disciplines, kind of like Lana mentioned, uh, like producing and other things like that. You can even transfer into design. Um, but yeah, I worked there for two years. Um, also was a little bit low, lower pay than I had expected, especially in an expensive place like Playa Vista, California. So I started looking again, and then um, I actually had an opportunity to work at Blizzard, but this time as a full-time employee, um, and I worked on the Battle.net team. So I went from like games and engine to uh, web and mobile. Uh, worked on the Battle.net team. I actually worked on quite a few apps at the same time. I worked on the BlizzCon app. I worked on the Battle.net social app for iOS and Android. I also worked on the mobile auth SDK, which is kind of like an internal application that all of our mobile games touch. Um, and then that was an interesting experience for me as well. Just I like challenging myself and learning new things. And there's just so much to learn in QA in general. And, you know, you can move into different aspects of it as well. Um, and after... After about two years of that, uh, the state of California sued Blizzard for sexual harassment discrimination. It's a very, like, known thing. Um, and, you know, the company kind of didn't handle it well, and I felt really like, you know, the my voice was being, like, silenced, and I was trying to make it better for people, especially people that were marginalized, um, because it shouldn't have to be, like, a rat race to, like, improve your livelihood uh so chart started advocating for just better conditions in the industry um and kind of like <laughs> speed ran uh people just ha not you know being happy with my presence at blizzard uh some people were but i just it, it got to a point where i would like open slack and then just felt like i you know couldn't do my job because it was really stressful and then you know learning things about your company through kotaku or other articles is really stressful so then i actually thought i was done with the gaming industry for a little bit um and then luckily i found a company uh that i worked at now it, they're called lightforge games fully remote studio um very people first embracing empathy which was all of the things that i was advocating for at blizzard um, and I'm quite happy with where I'm at now. Um, I'm a senior technical test analyst. Uh, my goal is to move into a leadership role because I feel like, you know, throughout my experience, I've kind of learned like how not to lead people just based off of the things that I've experienced and a lot of my other friends have experienced. Um, and I, I'm, I think I'm well on the track to do that and hopefully make the industry a little better for, uh, you know, people trying to break into it. And yeah, it was a really long <laughs> origin story, but thanks for sticking it out. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for telling uh, telling us about kind of your career path. And uh, I think um, uh, I think um, maybe for some of the some of the people who have uh, uh, sat through um, these roundtables for the other disciplines, I think it's it's really telling how frequently uh, and uh, like the jobs kind of like. Uh, people have to rotate in and out um, and kind of precarious. A lot of these employment situations are, I think, even compared to other roles in the games industry. But um, to, keep, uh, uh, to, uh, to keep this going along, um, what do you think, uh, for someone who is trying to get into a QA role at a games company, what do you think uh, is something people can do to improve their odds of uh, landing their first job? Um, Jessica. Yeah, I actually love this question because I give this advice to everybody <laughs> that asks me. Um, there's a wonderful website called a um, ASTQB.org. It's the American Software Qualifications Testing Board. Um, and they have resources that are free online. They have syllabuses uh, that you can download a uh, foundation level tester um, and you can actually get certified as a foundation level tester and the foundation test is pretty much just teaching you the terminology of like you know what types of testing you're going to see on the job like what types of bugs you're going to encounter and a lot of the first um like syllable uh syllabus sorry is mostly terminology so something that helped me a lot was just making flashcards um and just thinking about like when to apply certain types of testing that's really important too and, and the differences between you know um the types of testing and then once you get your foundational level you can um branch off of that and you can go into more disciplined uh, level or for myself i went into like uh, advanced level which is the technical test analyst um, and it, it really is a great resource, not only for, you know, trying to get a career in QA, but just understanding how games are developed um, and the terminology used because it's universal around multiple, um, you know, uh, studios. So that's the first thing I tell people. Um, my first experience with this was when I was a contractor in Blizzard Entertainment. Um, I saw all of the full-time employees taking the test and Blizzard paid for it. I, as a contractor, didn't have that um, privilege. So I actually ended up downloading the syllabus online on, on my own and then uh, paid like $200 at a testing site to get tested and passed. Uh, and that's how I was able to like come back as a full-time employee because I already had that certification. Um, and it's just, it's, it looks great on your resume. And even if you don't take the test, just knowing the terms is very helpful and it can give insights into whoever's interviewing you on how much you actually know about quality assurance and, and you know, how to, like what an asset you can be in, in identifying and reporting issues. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, Hannah or Anna. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm a little bit uh, of an eternal student, but when it comes to the game industry, I was, uh, I did the baptism by fire type thing, uh, which is just throwing you into uh, whatever you're going to do and learning because a lot of studios um, don't offer any training. Uh, when you get there and you kind of learn from like at Activision, I learned a lot on COG Ghost from just like talking to other testers. Um, I like what Jessica said for um, getting uh, a little bit more information about like what are the different types of bugs and everything like that. What helped me personally is having like an inquisitive mind uh, since I didn't do like any classes or any specific courses for QA. Um, wanting to know why something happened like it's is often something that you're going to be required to do in a qa role um something can have happened like 45 minutes ago and you have like to find the repro steps uh, as to what you did so uh trying to have like a good memory and maybe practicing some stuff like that is always like helpful because you're gonna have like to think a lot about like why this thing broke and also trying to uh express uh faithfully the issue because like often like people will only read like repro steps or stuff like that so communicating that issue like 
in a clear manner. So maybe the programmers or the artists understand the issue as well. It's something that you can do like on top of what Jessica was talking about, because like there's so many like different things when it comes to uh, QA. Uh, there's audio QA, there's localization QA, there's like the more technical stuff. So I know that some friends were like super interested in everything that had to do with releases and also like consoles. Uh, they have like technical requirements for that. And I know that a lot of the information is, is available online. So if you're interested uh, more specifically by like Microsoft stuff, like Xbox, like there's some information that you can get. And then you, when you get to a job, you can tell them, well, I've been interested in that and I've been reading up on that. Um, I'm not sure if there's some official like uh, class you could take. Uh, for these specific things, but I know that one of my friends was like super interested and he was like Jessica said, like the knowledge like tester when it came to everything technical, because uh, QA is not always like fun stuff that you do. Sometimes it's like more technical stuff that you need to do before a release. And uh, we always need these people and often no one wants to do these tasks. So specializing yourself in that and finding an interest in a specific aspect of QA that you like can also be like a good way to show like just an interest in, in the passion in, in the discipline. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Uh, Jade. Yeah, awesome. So super great advice uh, from everyone so far. What I'd say from my own perspective, being hired kind of at a third party company that kind of like takes the games uh, from other like, uh, like developers and tests them. Um, it's often like super entry level stuff, but there's still some things you can do to really show and uh, shine through during your interview or even during your application initially. Um, what I would say is that showing that you have an interest in games is really great. Uh, however, like showing that you can get involved in uh, some like events or different things like that can also help you out. Like if there's play tests going on or game jams going on, just showing that like you're involved in the process of like creating a game uh, can be a really big asset. Uh, as well, like communication skills are pretty important uh, in QA, just like through text, your issues uh, that you're going to be writing up need to be super understandable. Uh, what could help is maybe showing involvement through like different like writing uh, things that you've like produced. Um, and another thing that I'd add on is that um, documentation and the process of creating tools is super important uh, when you're working in QA as well. So showing if you can like create something and maintain it over time uh, can be potentially an asset. It could be something like a website. It could be a spreadsheet of something like that that is just available for people to use as a tool. Um, beyond that, I don't know what else I can say, so I'll leave it at that. Can I add something that I just thought about on the, the bilingual side? Yeah, go um, at QA, I, there's a history at the QAQ at Activision because, um, it was there for like years. And uh, one of the urban legends, uh, that happened is that a lot, because I'm a, I'm a French speaker originally. Uh, you might know from the accent, but a lot of the testers that they hired because they thought that you could pick up like any tester from the street and make them a QA, uh, which is not the case, is that a lot of them were French speaking only. So they had them play the game and then find the issue. And then they had them tell English speakers what the issue was. So they had to then uh, write up the issues. So it's always a good thing. And it's, it's a shame that most of the industry is Anglo centric. Um, but it's a fact. So if you're uh, not uh, an English speaker, it might be a good idea also to brush up on these skills um, because the, the industry works mostly in English. So that's my check. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I mean, thank I'm, you. I'm also from Montreal and a native French speaker. So brushing up on those English skills can help you out for sure. Um, let's uh, let's shift a little bit and talk about the what gets discussed a lot on um, I, I think on Twitter about uh, about whether or not seeing QA roles as a stepping stone to uh, other disciplines within within the industry. What are your opinions on that? Uh, and you want to start? 
I can, but like, I, I, I feel like I'm in an awkward position because like I had like a couple years where I was trying to move on from QA. But not because like I didn't like QA. I did like eight, um, it's going to be like a decade in the industry, like in June. And I did like eight years and a half of QA. So I feel like like in, in general life, I, I had like two bachelor degrees because I never knew what I wanted to do. And I kind of repeated that in the industry. Uh, there's so many things, but a lot of those disciplines like require like technical background. Like you cannot like jump from QA to being an artist if you're bad at drawing like me. So like my choices were a little bit more limited, uh, but it's not because I didn't like QA. It's like personally, um, I had found like a, my interest was not as high as when I started. And also like Jessica mentioned a lot of like the competition, um, a lot of our experience is similar as mine. Uh, the precarity of the work, like the only time we had vacation while we were QAs at Activision was when we were fired. Um, after I did Call Ghost, I, I asked to, to move on projects while it was still ongoing because the 72 hours a week was draining me. It was exhausting and you don't see your summers. And like Jessica, I was also on night shift. So we did like 5.30 p.m. to 2 a.m. And that is without crunch. So 72 hours, it was even worse than that. Uh, they even asked us at some point to volunteer for 14 hours and it ended up being 16. And when I told my boss, I need to leave because you're paying me to do nothing because I am a zombie, uh, they, they made you feel bad. So there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of exhaustion uh, linked to QA and everything like that. And there's a lot, um, at least for me, a lot of powerlessness because uh, I'm a vocal person, a little bit like Jessica. I think Jessica is a little bit more uh, of an activist uh, uh, from my perspective. So I was vocal like within the studio, but like this is perceived uh, as toxic because a lot of people, a lot of bosses like want you to just have a very low salary uh, and also be disposable. So that kind of takes a toll on you. Um, and I wanted to have like a little bit more power, I guess, like to change my situation, but also to advocate for other QAs and other people like in the industry. Uh, some studios are uh, notorious for having lower than uh, standard salaries um, for all disciplines. So like you want better for yourself and you want better for other people. And I kind of tried to find my place where I could make that happen. And uh, from talking to people and also like um, experiencing like some stuff in my own studio while I was at Larian, I saw that production might be like a good way for me to have a better impact. Um, like right now I worked with two different dev teams and, and one of the things I tell them a lot is that don't overwork yourself and, and also like good communication. So I learned a lot of stuff of how not to do, how not to treat people, and I'm I'm trying to apply that. And I felt a little bit powerless as a QA to make that change happen. So that's why for me I, I moved out of that. But QA in itself is is a is a great discipline that has like so many different facets. Um, but you need to be passionate because it it demands like so much of you. I feel like if your heart isn't in it, it's it's difficult to maintain that level of quality of work. And uh, yeah, for me, it was just like uh, the end of my journey as a QA. So uh, that's my take. Thank you. Um, Jessica, what do you think? Yeah, um, it's interesting for me because like, I'm still in QA, right? So. And the number one thing I get is like, why? Why are you still in QA? And I think it's because I am stubborn in that I love the job and I love the people I work with and I want to make it better. I think QA notoriously kind of has the same view from the bosses as like the external world in that like bugs exist in a game. So obviously your QA is not that great, uh, but that's <laughs> quite wrong. Um, but games would never ship uh, if there were but like no bugs that just is impossible you can't find all the bugs um and that being said like I, I just wish that it was paid better uh i think that we could remove a lot of the toxicity that happens in the qa floor by just treating them like people and paying them what they're worth because it really is an important job i like to call qa the player advocate 
um, because I mean we're the the la essentially the last line of defense before the it gets into the player's hands. So you're gonna want someone like me who is very passionate about the game and making a good game to be working on that game. And instead of like having a lot of really tired, overworked, underappreciated, underpaid, you know, people that they just think they can pluck off the street and, and hand a controller um, working on the game. And I think there's just that like old view, um, especially in the AAA industry. I know this is like an indie space, but of how like QA operates. And I think a lot of indie spaces are breaking down those barriers. So while, you know, using QA as a stepping stone to get into other de departments is something that has been done. Um, and it's it, it's good to like make those connections and, and, um, and network and build your portfolio. That's definitely okay. Learn the terminology, learn how the sausage is made, like Anna mentioned. Um, and I just think it's a really fun game. <laughs> like, like it's a fun job. It just, I wish uh, that passion wasn't exploited into you know eventually making people leave the industry or moving to other disciplines because i do feel like it's a great discipline i just feel that it could be viewed better by uh, you know like upper management and even players sometimes because you know very often you hear like do they even have qa like did qa even test this and nine times out of ten it's in the database i promise um it's just you know qa doesn't get the resources that they need to be like the powerhouse that they are that i see it as anyway um but that's my take you absolutely can uh get into the industry through qa it is a stepping stone however there are a lot of things holding you back um if you're too good at qa and you want to go into design your lead might say you're not allowed to move because you're too good at your job or you have to find a replacement that very much happened to me <laughs> um it is something that happens so it's just like one of those things where I would say if you are passionate about games and you like breaking things, do it. It's fun. Um, if you know, if you want to be a designer or something, just to, from day one, just work on your portfolio. Make sure you have, you know, all your ducks lined up, and then start networking. Whether that be through joining QA or going to game dev meetup events, either way is a good way to do it. But that being said, you know, a lot of the AAA companies do exploit that passion. Zane, can you give us your perspective? Absolutely, yes. So here's my most uh, lukewarm take. Uh, so for sure, QA as a stepping stone to the industry. It worked for me. I mean, I'm now a designer. Um, I would have something else to add, though, which is that at the end of the day, uh, as long as games are being made, um, they're going to need artists. And just as much as they're going to need artists and programmers and designers, they're going to need people who do QA. And QA as a discipline is something that you can delve deep into, get really good at. You can do work that is so incredibly skilled. Um, and you have the power, as Jessica said, to be like that last line between the game and the player something that I used to do uh, back in my certification days is if I found like um, something like a feature that wasn't working for accessibility reasons, I'd really push for, you know, a ticket to be written and say like, hey, the game might be unplayable for some people. And I think that's a legitimate issue. Whether or not I got pushback on that and that it got listened to is another story. But, you know, just being in that space, I feel like there's a lot of potential that someone can do and that it's a worthwhile endeavor for sure. Thank you. Um, so I've never worked in QA, and uh, uh, this is not a perspective from someone who kind of comes through that uh, uh, discipline, but uh, I have been hiring people for a long time in the games industry. And I do want to say that there are people that straight up like apply for jobs saying like, this is not the job I want, but I will take it because I will take any job in the games industry. And um, uh, my advice to you is don't do that. I have never wanted to hire anyone who's like, I don't want this job, but I'll take it because it's a stepping stone. <laughs> because obviously, I mean, regardless of if, whether or not uh, it's something you want to do for the long term, we're we're uh, we're definitely not going to hire somebody who's like 
not passionate about the exact position that we're hiring for. So that is that is something that I do want to kind of throw in there. I agree with that because um, I, I had written down stuff while Jessica and, and Jade were talking because like uh, they were making great points. And uh, my thoughts were just don't come in and think that like three months later, like just after like passing your probation, you're going to switch disciplines because it's a little bit insulting. I mean, it's a lot insulting <laughs> to you could see it as a stepping stone, but like I, I fundamentally believe that every dev should like at least do a little bit of QA. You should know how to operate the database. You should know like what they're doing and like everybody knowing what other people are doing, like that makes us stronger as a team. I'm a super idealist, but like I truly believe like good communication and everything makes it better and QA should be embedded um, in pre-production. So like QA is so important like that. I love what Jessica and, and Jane are saying because people don't know exactly what QA is doing. And uh, thinking that it's just just a stepping stone, that's the part that I have an issue with. You can want to do something else, but I feel like you need to do your due diligence and you should at least do a year in QA before you go somewhere else because it's, yeah, I feel like it's insulting to the discipline, to be honest. If I could add something onto that as well, I feel like a lot of the time where QA as a stepping stone is discussed, like people aren't acknowledging some of the like elements that make that a reality, which is that QA being an entry, like having a lot of entry positions is for a reason. Like you're not going to be compensated very well for your work. Um, you are going to be worked to the bone. And a lot of the companies that I worked at, like those kind of types of companies, like treat their employees and like throwing them in a meat grinder. And it's oftentimes that you'll see someone at work for an, like a period of time and like a week later, they'll be just gone because they're exhausted, they're overworked. Um, yeah. Yeah, someone asked a question in our chat here um, from Ghost Cat. It says, what is an employer looking for specifically when it comes to applying for a QA position? A lot of the things that I see is like attention to detail, very well written like skills. Um, you should be able to accurately describe what you're seeing and then investigate um, what you think might have caused the thing to happen. You don't always have to have the answer, but you have to give enough detail so that way when the engineer um, you know, goes to reproduce it, they have what they need to, to figure out what the issue is instead of them spending hours debugging something. Um, it just it helps their job go a little bit smoother when you have as much information as possible. So like screenshots, videos, um, really well written summaries, um, call out if you think it's a specific kind of issue like missing geo, um, you know, something's not there um, or just like, yeah, th um, that ISTQP resource will help a lot in identifying those things as well. So even familiarizing yourself with the terminology is really important. Um, but yes, mostly looking for attention to detail, well-written skills, um, and the ability to work long hours <laughs> in some studios. But and do you want to extend on that? I think she she made such good points. I was just like agreeing out loud while I was muted. Um, <laughs> yeah, because like you need to stay focused. Uh, anybody can stumble on bugs. Like people are like, uh, I'm not gonna mention the specific discourse on Twitter because like every day there's a new one. Uh, but everybody thinks they know what QA does. Um, it's a lot more complex than it looks like. Uh, there's some issues sometimes that disappear and no one knows uh, how that happened, including the programmers. So like there's a magic that happens in in games. Um, but yeah, you need to be focused for a, a large amount of, of hours because uh, like uh, Jessica said, you need to be focused on communicating the issue and also reproducing it. Uh, if you can't do that, that's the base of, of our job uh, as QAs. I still say our because I feel like when you start as a QA, it's it's like you've been in the trenches. Uh, every time I learned that one of my coworkers uh, has a background in QA, it's like you, it's, you're bonded through like some kind of trauma uh, because it's difficult and it's also undervalued. So putting your heart into that kind of stuff because you want, like Jessica said, be a player advocate. 
and then like people just shit on your job uh, it's difficult um but yeah like uh being able to maybe not care about that stuff is also like something that i would say could be useful I could also add on to something I think it was like excellently put that you said like once you start in QA uh, you never really leave. Um, something else that I'd add on to like what exactly you could like what an employer would be looking for is good interdisciplinary knowledge. So when you're finding a bug um, it might be super easy to write it up like let's say uh, it's an object that's jittering in a scene. Um, but the reason why it's doing that and who you address the bug to um, takes a lot of skill to kind of discern. It could be a problem maybe with an animation. It could be a problem with how the object is coded. It could be a problem um, just like with uh, the design of something that like colliders are interacting weirdly. So really like a thousand different things it could be and you need to have that interdisciplinary skill to tease out kind of which element is uh, at fault there. And really quick, everyone who's come out of QA has one bug, one dumb bug that they always talk about that's their favorite bug because it's just so ridiculous. It caused the engineers to freak out. <laughs> and um, that, that I hold a lot of pride uh, in my job for that. I like walking up to engineers and they're like, what now? And I'm like, hey, got some new stuff for you. Um, it's really funny because uh, I've, you hear a lot even in QA is like, well, it works on my device or it works on my machine. Uh, <laughs> okay, but, you know, did you factor in games as a live service? Did you factor in like servers or, you know, there's just so many things that can cause something to go wrong. And um, part of like figuring out the puzzle is really fun for me, at least in QA. Um, so, yeah, very, very good attention um, to that kind of stuff and identifying pain points. Um, again, as a as a non QA person, but as someone that does hire on occasion QA people, um, something I do want to mention is that more like a lot of employers are, especially for um, entry level positions. Um, obviously, we want people that are competent and know what they're doing and know what they're talking about. But oh no, oh no, Did he drop? Oh no. It cut out as butt. It was perfect. Yeah. Who's going to write the ticket for this wow. one? Anybody wants to QA what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hold on, I'm logging into Jira. I, I got to go talk to the Discord admins. My file just disappeared. Question mark. Don't know what, oh, yeah, what a cliffhanger. Uh, let's... He's being silenced by big QA. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, hey, hey, there we go. Hello. <laughs> Welcome hey, back. Resolved. Uh, we don't hear you right now, Masao. I feel like this talk wouldn't be complete without us having a bug in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> For <surprising>. sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, Mas Masao, you, you like broke, um, broke up a bit as well. So I'm not sure if it's an issue on your end or if it's on Discord's end. It might be a UI issue. I'm, I'm noticing that the leave the stage button is right next to the mute button. Oh, <laughs> that, that, that might, that might be feedback for a uh, Discord. Um, so while we wait for Masao to uh, get things working, I have a question from um, the Twitch. So is a portfolio of some sort recommended? How do we show off examples of QA work? Oh, uh, when I mentioned a portfolio, this was more directed towards like using QA to get into something like design or, you know, another department because something that they'll want to see is a portfolio of like, you know, if you're an artist or if you have like ui designs or if you want to be a character designer or environment designer um start building your own portfolio on the side while you're working qa so you're like learning how the sausage is made learning how game development happens and then at the same time also having a portfolio um i don't 
I don't think you need a portfolio for QA specifically, but um, I mean, if you've ever like modded something or, um, you know, just kind of like tinkered with games files or things like that, like that's good stuff to call out too, but you don't, you don't need to come in with a, a big folder and say, here's why I should be QA. Um, I think a lot of the technical questions in the interviews can kind of get that information out. Thanks for asking, by the way, if that wasn't clear for everyone. So that's clarifying. And I mean, like the, a lot of the studios will maybe like give you like a, a key of one of their games and ask you to find bugs and explain them. So like, you'll have like an in-house test, like usually. So that's how like they, at least for me in my experience, uh, they verified your skills. Like it's really difficult to, to show like your work as a QA in that form, like beforehand, it's really test and stuff like that. I'd, on, I'd add on to that, like for the portfolio thing, that if you are interested uh, in making a portfolio to kind of like branch out of QA or even to like find a role within it, um, just showing like knowledge of game engines at a basic level, like it doesn't have to be a super elaborate project, but just knowing where things, uh, how like engines work, um, even super basic ones, like you can go for like Unity or, you know, like Game Maker and just showing like the process of like linking up audio or graphics to like small little experiences. Uh, it can be really a feather in your cap to kind of show off uh, during an interview. And I feel like it also applies for when you're in like a studio. If you manage like to be around like other like devs that are doing like maybe like a discipline that you're interested in, like ask them questions. Like you can gather like so much information from just like the people you work with. Like that's how I figured out that I didn't think that production was boring and I learned more about what it was and you can uh, learn a lot about a lot of stuff and depending on the studio. Uh, and one thing that I also recommend like asking during the interview is if they like to promote internally, you'll know beforehand if it's worth it to try to use like you as a stepping stone for that. Because like uh, what Jessica said like earlier is very true. If you're too good as a QA, and I've seen it before, um, they will try to keep you there. So it's important to communicate like your needs and also like your career path. Um, if no one ever asks you about that, like that's kind of a red flag. Yeah, set your expectations of what you, you're you looking to get in, in your career of the games industry, whether that's, you know, mentorship. A lot of people join QA and shadow other departments and then realize, wow, I really like production or design or... You know, there's so many ways that you can branch out. Um, and yeah, it's it's helpful. I do see a couple questions in the chat here, so I want to address them if that's okay. There's one, um, it says, there seems to be a trend in the industry of studios moving towards outsource QA, often with companies that recruit exclusively from low-wage low areas or that work with zero-hour contracted freelancers. Do you think this will destroy QA as entry into the industry? Um, I want to say no. I don't think it will, just because um, good QA is so important and vital to the life of a project that 100% um, outsourcing... Like I've worked at studios that have internal QA and outsource departments, so I don't think it's like one versus the other. I think it's like expanding resources that way, um, you know, like for Activision, we had people 24 hours on the clock, like day shift and night shift. Um, and maybe that's to create better working conditions for full-time employees if they kind of like outsource some of the work towards other, you know, time zones and things like that. So I do see that. Um, that being said, we live in uh, capitalism, and a lot of people want to find ways to, uh, you know, get things out for less. Um, so I do think that regardless of any industry that you're in, outsourcing can be a problem. Um, but it's about, like, identifying what is important to a project, and people that really care about the project will put that money and time and effort into building a QA department. On, on that topic, uh, so I've been in the games industry since 2006 and outsourcing QA was already a thing. And I've definitely seen, as Jessica mentioned, kind of this ebb and flow. Um, there are studios that initially have more internal QA and then they outsource it. And then they realize that they're uh, they're having issues with skill retention. So I ended up, uh, end up having more people in, in, internally. So 
I don't feel like it's a, a directly outsourcing, uh, everything is going to outsourcing kind of kind of thing that's happening. I feel like it's something that I've I've always seen and I don't see like a complete trend for complete outsourcing as Jessica says. Uh, yeah, and if I might add to that, like um, at Larian, they have like an internal QA, but they, they also like take um, external and at the publishing company where I work as well. Um, but what you need to understand is that if you do outsourcing, you still need to manage them. Uh, you still need to uh, maybe share a database with them. You need, still need to prioritize like the issues that they're going to file. Like there's still a lot of work uh, to do and you cannot go 100% without QA internally because you kind of need someone to know how QA works to, to just like manage outsource QA like that um, being like, let's say like an outsource producer or at least a, a QA outsource lead. Those are jobs like that people do because it requires like a lot of knowledge. You need to have like really good communication skills. Um, also, if you hire like QAs in other countries where like English is not the, the, the main language, you can have the communications barrier as well as far as like the quality of the bugs. Just because if English is not like their their main language, there might be like some issues with communication and stuff like that. Um, and one thing that I was talking about before is that how like I, I advocate for QA to be embedded in the team at pre-production because like the knowledge that QA acquires working internally um, and having worked like let's say on previous titles, maybe multiplayer and stuff like that, they will be able to raise red flags like before and tell you yes this is possible, but we will need X, Y, Z. So QA's knowledge is something that is built and uh, it's it's difficult to build that if you go with outsourcing because they might not have worked on previous titles and stuff like that. So it is super, super important to have internal QA. And I don't think that outsourcing is going to kill it. I think it's just complementary, as you guys have mentioned. Yeah, and if I can add on to that, as someone who worked at a company who was on the receiving end of that outsourcing, um, I, I don't think at all that it poses kind of like a risk to other kinds of positions. Like as long as outsource QA is a thing, there will, as other people have said, like there there will have to be people internally uh, in like part of the developer team uh, that's coordinating things for sure. And you know, even if you do get hired uh, at a place that is like third party. Um, the skills that you get in that are still applicable if you apply somewhere that does internal QA. Um, so there's definitely like so many different paths you can take. And I, I remember like being hired as a designer uh, at an indie studio. My first week uh, there, I was kind of the only person who had significant QA experience. My first week there was like just managing all their tools that they had for their QA process, streamlining everything, making sure everything was crystal clear. And uh, it definitely helped out uh, on that end. Nice. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for answering this question. These This information has been super helpful. Um, should we wrap up? Uh, it's one minute until four. Um, we could take one more question, depending on how much time our guests have. I'm OK to take the ISTQB question I see in the chat here, because yeah. it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. Cool. Thank um, you. It's, it's, yeah, of course. Uh, it's not an absolute requirement, so don't feel that you need to take the exam. Um, but I would strongly advocate for reading the syllabus and the, the um, like vocabulary. I feel like it's really, really a strong indication that um, you have the attention to detail, and um, you know you you can kind of like get into the project and and just learn the project and systems versus like learning how to be a QA tester. Um, you don't ha I don't think taking the test is an absolute requirement. Some companies like Riot or Blizzard say that it is a requirement, but I would argue for you to apply anyway, because within those companies, they actually have avenues for you to take the exam. Like I know Blizzard uh, has a Blizzard University where they will pay for you to take the exam. So don't let that be a barrier for you. Awesome. I hope that answers your question, Raymond. So yeah, um, we're going to wrap up for today. Thank you so much, Jessica, Jade, Anne, for being with us today. Thank you, as always, Masao, for moderating for us. Um, 
yeah so <laughs> i hope everyone has a good sunday i know that it's not a, uh, the typical day that we go for so let us know if sundays work for you guys um you know we're, we're keep, we keep uh, testing things out uh, which days are better for events like these so we would love to know um and yeah any last words masao uh not much thank you very much for listening and thank you for uh, every, uh thank you for to all of our guests for a uh, great round table it was extremely informative and uh yeah thank you very much absolutely thank you for having us thank you okay, i'm gonna exit the stage now thank you everyone bye everyone bye bye be bye. excellent to each other goodbye